I want to talk today, it's, it's my job to come up here and talk to you about the E in layer, how we drive expand revenue with services teams. And we're going to talk for about 30 minutes and drill deep on the E in layer because it is, it is the overlooked letter. It's the one that kind of gets glossed over, right? And um, we're going to give you some homework assignments. So some, as Thomas would say, very layer experimental, expand experimental things that you can take home with you when you go back to the 200 companies and 30 plus companies from whence, or countries from whence you came, and try some of these new things that are involved in tactics to help you get your services teams more engaged in the sales process. Now, I'm up here because for the last you know, two and a half days, we've been talking about the blending of services and sales motions. And as it turns out, uh, that's what I talk about pretty much every day. Right? This expand selling line of research at TSIA is designed to give our members clear guidance and very prescriptive guidance <clears throat> on how to utilize these services teams and services touch points in services data uh, in the sales process for cost effective revenue growth with the emphasis really being on the growth because that's what we're all after. And the title of my talk today is the E in layer. And like I said, you know, E E's the hardest letter, all right? E's the unpleasant letter, right? The L, the land part, all right, that's kind of somebody else's problem, right? It's not something we always have to worry about. Um, and the A, the adopt, well, one, that's right in our wheelhouse. And two, it's a very warm and fuzzy thing, right? Adoption, it's, 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 it's nice, it's a feel-good story. We're comfortable with that. And the R, the renewal, we've been doing that for a long time. But the E, is hard, and people overlook the E all the time, right? Because E is going to require you to collaborate with other groups, all right? E is probably going to require you to do some salesy things, right? And E is going to require you to step outside of your comfort zone more than likely. Because, you know, for a lot of reasons. One, that E is really important because that's where the growth comes, not just on an account basis, but from an overall company basis, right? And I challenge you, by the way, that I don't care what your account health score says or your customer health score says. If your customer isn't growing, I don't think they're healthy, right? You can, you can pick your quote. All systems are in either growth or decay. You're either getting better or you're getting worse, right? If your accounts aren't growing, are they really healthy? Because healthy things grow. So to help give some, some background on this, on, on making sure that we can start to engage services teams in the sales process in both a safe and effective way, we like to lay down the ground rules, if you will, of how this plays out and, and some core principles of expand selling. And the first one is this idea of touch point calculus. Uh, as anybody who's been in sales will tell you, sales in many ways is simply a numbers game. And our services teams, Thomas Law talked about this yesterday, or, or, uh, in his original keynote on the first day. Uh, our services teams and customer success teams are interacting with customers sometimes, somewhere between five and 15 times as often as our sales teams. And so if you want to move the ball forward on cost-effective revenue growth, we've got to start taking advantage of these touch points. And while that's really, really important in our enterprise space with our biggest customers, I think it's even far more important with that small to medium business segment. Because with all, you know, the great thing about the Fortune 500, good and bad, is like there's only 500 of them, right? But there's 20,000 other customers, and there's no way to cost effectively reach those people if you're not leveraging the touch points you already have with them wherever they may occur. The second core concept we like to talk about is relationship equity. All right, services teams have trusted advisor status, which means that services teams can have some of the conversations that salespeople just can't have. Right, I, I, you know, I've, I'm a salesperson by trade, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but you know, I've been trained extensively to go ahead and try to drill down and find the pain points, find what the trouble that's really happening with the customer, what's their problem. You know, anybody in here who runs a support line or a support services team, yeah, you don't have any trouble finding out what the customer's problem is, right? They're telling you all the time. So these are the kinds of conversations you have, but you get to ask questions that salespeople don't. Because in sales, their charter is to separate you from your money. 
and the customer knows that, and they know that, but there is a level of trust that can happen with services teams that really can't happen with sales. So I guess somewhat ironically, this is the quote that really guides us. If this were Star Trek, I'd say this quote is the prime directive, right? Helping will sell, selling won't help. And JB said that, and we stand by it. And a long time before I came to TSIA, um, I really started to embrace this principle. I worked for Google for about seven years doing business development. I was one of their early biz dev guys. And we used to say at Google that you know, advertising and selling, it's not evil. In fact, it can be very helpful. Uh, if you're doing a search on a dozen roses, and there's a good chance, for instance, that the ads for that search result might be more uh, relevant to you and more helpful than the search results themselves. So we believe that sales outcomes, sales motions, can be the natural and helpful result of a services conversation if we keep these things in mind. One, we're still trying to help the customer solve a problem. And everything we do is in the context of either helping them solve a problem, leverage their technology investment, or get to their desired outcome. And so those are the ground rules, right? We're not trying to turn your sales, your services teams into little mini salespeople. But we do have to leverage these touch points and opportunities. So as I said, I grew up in sales. Uh, my first job, uh, clear back in the 20th century, was selling browsers for Netscape. You guys remember Netscape? Right. Yeah, so my, my first sales job was to try to convince companies that they should spend $50 a head on a piece of software that they already had installed on their computers for free. So that was a good way to learn to cut your teeth. But if you'd have told me any time during my sales career that I would get excited about frameworks, uh, I would have looked at you like you were nuts. Like, frameworks? Are you kidding me? But ever since I came to TSIA, I've realized that frameworks are awesome. All right? Frameworks give you a chance to actually organize your thoughts. Frameworks give you the ability to break up these motions into actual manageable bite-sized chunks that you can deal with. And so in expand selling, we're trying to do the same thing. We've broken it down into four separate and distinct motions that your services teams can take to start getting them more deeply engaged and involved in the sales process. And as you move from left to right on this continuum, from gathering and leveraging account intelligence all the way to different ways they can participate to generating leads and actually sometimes closing deals, right? the involvement, the proactivity goes up from left to right. In this stage one of gathering and leveraging account intelligence, there's really not much your services teams have to do. They don't have to change very much on their day-to-day -day business uh, practices. right? They're already generating a ton of incredibly useful customer data. Here's the problem. That data requires a translation to be useful in the sales and marketing process, right? Because we're thinking about support tickets, and we're talking about statements of work, and we're talking about project plans, and we're talking about compliance, and they're talking about prospects and leads and opportunities and, and, and campaigns and all sorts of other things. So the challenge is to take that customer data and turn it into actionable insights, which we're calling account intelligence. In fact, we're going to run a survey on this. Most of the work that's been done on utilizing services and customer success data for, uh, for sales and product usage has been around kind of the defend motion, present, you know, preventing churn. We want to take a look at how we use this data act to actually grow customers. So to lead up to your first homework assignment for when you get home, I want to introduce you to a new friend that you may have seen from afar, but chances are you probably haven't spent much time talking to. And they are called marketing. Uh, now, this, the whole sales and marketing thing, you know, we, in sales and marketing, we've kind of sort of figured out how to work together. That doesn't mean it's always smooth, right? Sales guy is going to say, well, I need more leads. And marketing is going to say, well, you got plenty of leads. And then sales says, yeah, but they're not any good. And marketing says, well, how would you know? You never called them. And sales and services, you know, there, there's a relationship there, tenuous, as we all know, right? Because service is going to say, well, you never sell any services. And sales is going to say, yeah, but you slow my deals. And, and services says, yeah, well, I know I slow them down, but you just need training, right? So we've all heard this before, but either way, these relationships are established. Between services and marketing, I'm telling you, y'all don't know each other at all. At all, right? It's like peanut butter and sardines. Never the twain shall meet. And, but... But you need to get to know each other because you need each other and you can help each other. I'm telling you. So on a layer experimental way, 
a first kind of tactic that you can take. I want to bring up an example of one of our expand selling members called Xenos. And, uh, you know, they're, a, they're a, a, an as a service company based in Austin. And they didn't do Amazon level, you know, data mining or, you know, PhD level analysis here. They took the absolute simplest of services data, support tickets. And they have an annual user conference in Austin. So all they did was they took a look and said, well, okay, who's calling us with the most support tickets? Who are my users that are having problems? And they put together a user bundle or a bundle at their user conference where they could come and there was an education and some special perks. But when they did this and they just utilized this very basic, most basic of services generated data, they were able to double their enrollment in that track. So homework assignment number one, when you get home, you go make a friend in marketing and bring your data. And I guarantee you, they have no idea it exists. And by the way, just so you know, when you go talk to your friends in marketing, the hottest term in marketing right now, and what all of their consultants are telling them to do, is account-based marketing, or ABM, all right? So they're trying to figure out, their people are telling them that they need to create custom messages and custom offers uh, for, for the, for e on an individual customer basis. And guys, they're trying to do that with whatever little information they can glean out of HubSpot. All right, you have that data. I don't think you can do account-based marketing unless you use the services generated data. And you don't want them to, by the way, because the last thing you want is for marketing to generate a custom offer that doesn't factor in their health score, that doesn't factor in their renewal cycle. You need to go make a friend. They can help you too, right? Their whole job is presenting and, and capturing the value of things and, and services can be part of that. So get to know your marketing folks, okay? General nods, homework assignment number one, go meet a new friend. All right. The second stage that we like to talk about is participating in the sales process, becoming more involved with the sales process. And over the next six to nine months in the expand selling research practice, we're going to try to start, put, you know, start putting some rhyme and some rope and some reason around all the other things that services teams are being asked to do in the sales process, right? Everything from, well, okay, is, is, is engineering, is what, what happens to the SE, right? If services are going to be on the hook for delivering it, how involved should we be in the pre-sales process? What does it look like in quoting? What does it look like in scoping? And we're going to try to get some rhyme and reason around that. But it's in this part of the, of the continuum that the real blending of services and sales motions comes together, especially when you take a layer away um, and move into the PIMO model. In the world of PIMO, you know, there's not a transactional model anymore. The sales relationship doesn't stop when the contract is signed, nor does it terminate when services takes over to get them up and running, right? Sales has that relationship all the way through the PIMO model in many cases. Services has the relationship all the way in the PIMO model. You're probably going to be involved in the pre-sale. But again, we want to give you the most basic of things that you can work on to begin warming up, to start getting your people more comfortable with starting to have these sales-related conversations. And I think one of the best tactics I've ever seen at this <clears throat> is something that Microsoft did. So they like to tell the story, and they've told it at a couple of our conferences now, about the Uptel conversation. They, they created a campaign called Achieve More Conversations. And essentially, all they did with their pre-sales tech support team, by the way, if you want to know why, the, how the industry has changed, just the idea that you could have pre-sales tech support kind of tells you what the world looks like now. But what they did with uh, some of their lines of business, like, say, Skype for Business, is they challenged their support team to say, okay, once you've solved the customer's problem and once they're a happy customer, just take a few extra minutes and show them one feature of Skype that they didn't know they had, but they could be using. Very simple, right? Just a pure education play. But it started to get their engineers thinking beyond the fix about having that conversation beyond just solving the problem and moving on, all right? And you can see the results. I don't need to read them to you. But those are legitimate, right? You're talking about massive gains in usage. The, the churn reduction was so high they didn't even want to put it on the slide. Right? And we're talking massive jumps in CSAT just by taking that extra time to do that. But here's the thing. I'd love it if you try the uptail conversation. But whatever you start to have your services teams do in the sales process, all right, 
make sure you give them core relief on metrics. All right, so it's okay to do this. I'm not gonna press you on call resolution time. I'm gonna give you a little bit of relief on your volume. Field services teams, for those of you who have field services teams, are fantastic at this. All right, but you might have to, you know, Val Golovsky has a case study where he said, you know, in order to get them to take some sales motions, you might need to give them a little bit of relief. You know, include that in their direct hours, but put your money where your mouth is. Try new things, give relief on core metrics, and one other thing, track it. When you have these conversations, when you have these interactions, track it mercilessly like a bloodhound. Because you will prove that every time you have these conversations, every one of your metrics goes up. But if you don't write it down, it didn't happen, okay? So we're gonna try new things, we're gonna give people permission to do it, and we're gonna track it. Everybody cool with that? Homework assignment number two? All right. The next stage, as we've put it down, of engaging services in the sales process is this idea of generating leads. And you know, what we're talking about here, we're not talking about an outward campaign where you're going out and talking to people, it's not something that's marketing run, all right? During the course of doing their regular jobs, we found at TSIA that your services delivery teams, anywhere from support all the way up through professional services, can usually find upsell and cross-sell opportunities on somewhere between three and 5% of the things they work on. Sometimes up to 10, I think we've seen it at the highest. So, but again, we're, this isn't an outbound campaign. This is within the course of doing their regular jobs. We find these opportunities. And now, when you go to see your friend in marketing, your new friend that you're going to make, go ahead and take them this slide. Uh, because these are the lowest cost leads that you will ever find anywhere under any circumstances, all right? Just so you know, the average cost of a B2B lead in the technology industry is somewhere between $70 and $250. And leads generated by your services teams cost what? Somewhere between 670 and, and 70 if it's a professional services team taking an hour to go deep on it. Um, but, but the point is that it's actually not really about the cost, it's about the quality, right? These leads that are being taken by services people are closing at a rate between one in four and one in five. There are no other sources of leads from any other place, including your SDR inside sales teams where the leads close at this rate. And it makes sense. They are taken by very experienced problem solvers within the course of solving someone's problem. So again, this is something that I really encourage you to take a look at, especially <clears throat> if you are someone who has oversight of both sales and services, or if you are a services leader that has a number or a quota or even are under pressure to move from being a cost center to being a profit center. We just, this, this data is absolutely hot off the presses. I, I, we, we put it together just last week. And the, the number of leads represented by the people who took this survey, it's, they took between the companies that took it about 250,000 leads for sales last year. And half of them, half of them were for services related offerings. So if you have, you know, if you have oversight of both sales and services, I encourage you to take the steps to do this because this is how you grow your own food, right? This is how you find leads, right? Uh, that 10% on education services, actually if it's support, it goes up to about 20%, right? I don't know how you find leads for education services if you're not actually documenting the people who are having problems, right? Those are training opportunities. <clears throat> and for a great example of this, I bring up Cisco. They won the Star Award for Expand Selling last year. And back in 2013, they just started with a pilot, very, very small, like 13 engineers and, you know, in Western Europe, and it's grown now to where they've got over 2,000 engineers that take leads, and they're generating tens of millions of dollars of incremental pipeline at virtually no incremental cost to Cisco. But here's how you get started with it. I guarantee you that in your services delivery organization, whichever flavor that may be, there are people who are already taking leads. There are people who are finding something out and they're typing an email and sending it off to their sales team. So my encouragement to you, find out who those people are. Go home, do a little detective work, right? They're a great group to start a pilot with, by the way, because they're already comfortable with this. But in either case, look at what sort of information they're gathering. Find out what sort of information the sales team needs to make that an actionable lead, right? There are people who are doing this already. I guarantee you there are people who are already comfortable with this motion. Let's find them. Let's talk to them. So when you get home, homework assignment number three, do a little detective work, find out who's doing this and how they're doing it. 
And then finally, kind of the ultimate stage of leveraging services teams in the sales process. Can non-sales people actually close deals? Well, the answer is yes, but you've, you, you, there are circumstances that you need to apply to be able to make this work. So first of all, at most companies, upsells and cross-sells look just the same as every other sell. All right, there's no difference in who does it. There's no difference in process. There's no difference in comp. Most of the time, it's just sales handles everything. <clears throat> and I'll submit to you that that is an incredibly inefficient way of doing things. That would be like running a restaurant where you have one chef who cooks the appetizer and the entree and the sauce and the pastries, right? There has to be specialization. I worked for Ben Horowitz for about two years at LoudCloud. And, and specialization and customization are the, are the bitter arch enemies of scale and efficiency. So again, let's break this up. What can, sir, are there things, are there transactions that non-sales people can handle? And by the way, we have some data that says when non-sales people, customer success people or other services people are put in charge of upsells primarily, account growth can accelerate pretty well. And there's some reasons for that. You know, one of them is that they're closer to the customer. Two is if you've got an account executive who has, say, you know, a $5 million quota, that $50,000 upsell might not be all that interesting to them, but to somebody else who's closer to the customer, it's an important thing. And I love to use an example. Um, HP Enterprise won the Star Award last fall for field services for some of the uh, very, very innovative things that they're doing with their field services organization. So they have taken this from all across our continuum. It actually is kind of weird how well it lines up, but you know, they've looked at the data, they've looked at where the coverage gaps are, they look at what the problems are, and then before their FSE actually goes on site, they will feed him or her some prompts. These are some opportunities you might want to bring up. These are some things that could be used and could be, you know, again, the, in the context of helping somebody solve their problem, which in this case was avoiding downtime. So again, can they have these conversations? Yes. But you absolutely, and I want to leave you with this, you absolutely cannot make them sales generalists. They can't do everything. You can't just turn over the whole suite of products and offerings, right? That's, that's a bridge too far. The sales are too complicated. And I imply you, or I implore you, that if you're going to take this motion, you need to carve out for them a realm of things that can be handled, right? If you find your people, customer success, any services delivery person, right? These things need to be simple and transactional, straightforward if you want them to handle it, right? So if they're doing things like price negotiation or contract negotiation or multiple stakeholder alignment, you're probably asking them to do too much. They need to be simple and transactional, just like HP Enterprise showed you. They need to be as analytics driven as possible, right? Help them down the road. Give them something to talk about before they ever show up. And repeatable, right? We've seen time and time again that the more you can blend these things into certain outcomes that a customer might want to have, right? We see you know, common problems lead to common solutions and common outcomes. And that's your last homework assignment. I want you to go home and document. You can even think about this on the plane ride home, unless you're from San Diego like me, by the way, and, and then I guess it's a shorter car ride. But all right, document the five most common problems that you're running into and figure out how your offerings solve those problems. Now, maybe that'll lead to a product bundle. It may never, in fact, lead to having someone other than salespeople solve that problem. But even if it doesn't, you've documented like some very common outcomes. We want to drive people towards common outcomes. We want to drive people towards common solutions because that is very much how you gain efficiency and scale and growth. And I do want to say one thing before I move on out of this. Um, it wasn't in the slides, but I've talked to probably half a dozen people at this conference now who said, you know, I would love to start getting services teams more engaged in the sales process, but you know, right now our sales team is kind of going through a transition and blah, 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 we just lost our senior leader, you know, we're moving from a transactional model to a SaaS model, whatever it may be. I spent most of my career in sales. Do you guys want to know what happens during, to sales during a transition? Nothing. I mean, literally nothing gets done. 
um, they just kind of sit there and twiddle their thumbs because nobody wants to call an account that might not be theirs in two months. Like it, the work grinds to a halt during a sales transition. And my challenge to you folks is that when that happens, that's actually a time to engage services in the sales process more, not less. For one thing, you know, services turnover is way less than sales turnover, not just at the executive level, but actually at the delivery person level, right? So you want that customer to have a consistent touch point with you some way, even if it's not in sales. And two, if you're not engaging them in the sales process, then by the time that salesperson actually gets around and they figure out whose account it is and, and when they're going to call, well, basically, then they're just making a cold call to your install base. And that's not a good outcome for anybody. So again, just because there's sales transition doesn't mean, oh gosh, I can't change the way I do things in services. I'd implore you and, and encourage you that that's actually the time to take a little more control of the process and see if you can move the ball a little bit farther down the field than you otherwise would. Because somebody's got to do it, and this is an opportunity to gain that consistent touch point, okay? And I wanted to address that. So, to recap, your four homework assignments, when you get home, if you can't remember them, feel free to take a picture of the slide. These will be available later, but don't forget your homework. Now, my 13-year-old son does that all the time. Um, you're going to go make a new friend in marketing, and you're going to bring your data, and you're going to do it before they start doing account-based marketing to your accounts without knowing what you're actually talking about, right? That's number one. Number two, you're going to try some new things. The Uptel conversation is a great place to start, but you've got to give people real relief on their core metrics if you want them to try new things, right? Don't just give it lip service permission. Give it real permission. Three, you're going to go home, you're going to ask around, and you're going to find out who's already sending leads to sales and how they're doing it and what information they need and do a little bit of detective work on that because I guarantee you there's people doing it already. And then you're going to take a look at try to figure out some repeatable solutions. Whether you actually take that motion of closing them with your services or delivery or customer success people or not, it's a really good idea because the more you can drive people to common solutions, the more you can, go, you can have growth at scale. And then finally, as a member of the TSIA research team, I just want to encourage you that you don't have to do your homework by yourself. Um, we're all here to help. Uh, you know, if, if you want to know how renewals team should be engaged in the sales process, Julia Stegman in our SRG research practice has all sorts of information on how to handle that. Uh, George Humphrey probably knows more about selling managed services than any human being alive. So, and I, those are just to name a couple. I can't name everyone, but the point is that we're here to help. We have data to back it up. We have best practices. We kind of understand how this stuff works. And so as you're doing this homework, you've got a tutor, and that's TSIA. Thomas and JB have been way ahead of this curve, and, and we're all available to you. So again, as I close, encourage you, try new things. Don't be afraid to start engaging services teams in the sales process, even if it is just in the most layer experimental of ways, all right? We're in services, the E is hard, but we can't run from the E. We can't outsource the E, right? We can't just leave E to somebody else. We have got to take on the E, and we've got to wrestle it to the ground because that's our job. All right, thank you for letting me be up here today. I appreciate it. Safe travels home.